Good evening, everyone. I'm Jordan Spivey, joined with my dad. Travis Spivey. And in today's video, we'll be going over the understanding of Darwin's Voyage of Discovery and Natural Selection 101. So let's do this. So let's discuss the great Charles Darwin. And he was a British naturalist who proposed the theory of biological evolution by natural selection. Darwin defined evolution as descent with modification. And this is the idea that species change over time, give rise to new species, and share a common ancestor. The mechanism that Darwin proposed for evolution was natural selection. Because resources are limited in nature, organisms with heritable traits that favor survival and reproduction will tend to leave more offspring than their peers, causing the traits to increase in frequency over generations, which means that they're going to have more organisms in their population. And it's all about survival. Natural selection causes populations to become adapted or increasingly well suited to their environments over time. The key word is being well suited for your environment. Natural selection depends on the environment and requires existing inheritable variation in a group in order for the species to survive. One thing I like to compare natural selection to is high school. And think about this, in high school you have four different grade levels. You have ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and then 12th grade. And then I want you to think about this, does everyone from your ninth grade year actually make it to their 10th grade year? The answer is no. And some of the reasons why is because in high school, it's going to be much larger than it was in middle school. So think about it. Middle school, you was in a small pond, but you go to high school, you go into a much larger pond where you have many more people that you have to associate with and interact with. The content and the curriculum or the material that you're reading and that you're covering every day has gotten even harder and more challenging. And then in high school, you actually have more freedom. So that means you have to be extra careful with how you spend your time and how you use it. So that's why they say use your time wisely. So you have a lot of people from ninth grade that don't actually make it. And then you move on to your sophomore year. And then so some people still haven't quite learned how to manage their time. So their grades are falling behind and they're actually out here hanging with some people that they should be hanging around. So they have all these different influences pulling at them. So they don't make it past their sophomore year. And then you move on to your junior year. This is really like your hump year because this is the year where you're kind of at the end of the tunnel. You can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you're not quite there. And you have some people that just give up and quit because high school just seems like it just goes on and on and takes forever for them. And then you have some people that have personal situations that they're dealing with that for whatever reason keeps them from moving on to their senior year. So by the time you get to your senior year, so many people have fallen off your ninth, 10th, and 11th grade year because they weren't able to adapt or survive to this new and changing environment. So that's why I like to think about with natural selection. The people that make it to their senior and graduated are best suited and most well adapted to survive in this new environment and actually be successful and move on to high school and beyond. Now let's talk about Darren's journey aboard the HMS Beagle. Darwin traveled on a survey expedition on the HMS Beagle ship, which traveled to South America, which is right here, and it traveled to Australia, which is also right here, and it traveled to the southern tip of Africa. At each stop, Darwin studied and cataloged the local plants and animals. Darwin then began to see patterns in the distribution and features of organisms in the different locations. Now let's take a look at Darwin's Galapagos Islands observations. And Darwin observed that finches on the Galapagos Islands had similar but non-identical species. He noticed that each finch species were well adapted for its specific environment and role. So for example, species that ate large seeds tended to have large tough beaks. So let's look at this finch species right here. Notice that it has a large tough beak, most likely for breaking seeds and hard nuts. And then while those that ate insects had thin sharp beaks, so look at this finch species right here. So notice that these species look similar, but the big difference is, is the beak size of these species because they ate two different types of food. And then Darwin observed that animals found on the Galapagos Islands were similar to those on the nearby mainland of Ecuador. 
So he came up with the idea that each fence species acquired adaptations over many generations and long periods of time to make them better suited and better adapted to survive in their environment. And I want you to think about how people, when they go to different areas or go to different places, they make small adaptations to help them blend in and survive in that environment. So just like a person can go from one classroom to the next classroom or go from one school to the next or from one city to the next, everyone makes small adaptations in order to better survive in that environment. During Darwin's many travels and explorations while journeying on the HMS Beagle, he noticed three patterns of inheritance. He noticed that species vary globally, species vary locally, and species vary over time. And we'll be discussing that next. One of Darwin's first observations is that species vary globally. And he observed that different but ecologically similar animal species stayed in separated but ecologically alike habitats around the world. So for example, the South America grasslands is where the rias reside, and the Africa grasslands is where the ostriches reside, and then in the Australia grasslands, this is where the emu resides. And if you notice that these are different species, but they stay in separated and ecologically alike habitats around the world. And if you look at these species, they look awfully similar to one another. And here's another example of that. So here's our rhea. It stays in South America. Then here's Africa, and this is where the ostrich would reside. And then here's Australia, and this is where the emu would reside. If you notice, all three of these species are separated by vast amounts of water, but they look similar and they stand ecologically alike habitats. And then Darwin also observed that some species are only found in one place and nowhere else in the world, like kangaroos are only found in Australia. So you notice the eastern gray kangaroo resides here, the red kangaroo resides here, and then the western gray kangaroo was, resides here. And even though they may be different species, all of them have one thing in common. They all reside only in Australia. Now let's talk about the fact that species vary locally. Darwin observed that different but also related animal species frequently occupy different habitats within a local area. The main example of this is the Galapagos finches and the Galapagos turtles. This is largely because of the environment that places evolutionary pressures on the organisms who are trying to live to survive in that area. So if an organism does not adapt to its environment, then it will most likely not live too long. Darwin lastly observed that the fossils of extinct species were similar to species that were still alive. And this led him to the conclusion that species vary over time. And Darwin's many observations and discoveries led him to the evolutionary idea that species change over time by some natural process. This is natural selection. So we look at these two pictures on the right. Here's the glyptodont. And the glyptodont is no longer alive. It is extinct. But if you notice, it's very similar looking to this present day armadillo. And if you notice, look at the similarities between the two. The glyptodont has a hard shell and a hard tail for protection. And look at the, armor, the present day armadillo. It has a hard shell and a hard tail for protection as well. So if you notice, these, this glyptodont actually evolved into the present day armadillo over time through the process of natural selection. Let's go ahead and take a deeper dive into natural selection. And it's the process whereby organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. And there are four key principles of natural selection. The first would be variation. And within a population, some traits can be expressed in various ways and make individuals look and behave differently. It can be hair color, body size, eyes color, reaction while facing danger, and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and take a look at these dogs right here. If you notice, these dogs has varying, have varying sizes, shapes, uh, hair colors, and then if you notice, some of these dogs will actually run away from danger, while other dogs will actually run towards and face that danger and even attack the danger. And then our second key principle is inheritance. So heritable traits are transmitted to the next generation. And these are traits that made that individual more likely to survive. So if you notice that these two handsome individuals right here, if you notice the younger individual inherited some traits from the older individual that helped them more likely to survive and be cooler in life. 
And then the third key principle is a high rate of population growth or overproduction. And at each generation, the population produces more offspring than what the local environment can support. It leads to substantial mortality. So when we say survival of the fittest, some of these organisms are not, or some of these rabbits are not going to make it. Make it. The ones that are best suited for the environment, our traits are going to be passed on to the next generation. And then speaking of survival of the fittest, the fourth key principle is the differential survival and reproduction, which is also known as survival of the fittest. And like I just previously stated, individuals with the best combinations of traits to survive in the actual environment will produce more offspring for the next generation. So you take a look at this right here. Here's your cheetah right here, and it's chasing after two animals. One animal is going to be faster than the other one, and one is going to be slower. And the slower animal is probably going to end up as the cheetah's lunch. And the other animal is going to be able to survive and has a higher likelihood of passing their traits on to their offspring. So let's quickly summarize those four key principles and show how natural selection works. First, we have overproduction. Populations produce too many young and many must die. So that means that some are going to make it and some are not. And then we have variation. Individuals show variations. Some variations are more favorable than others. So the variation that gives the organisms a better chance of survival is going to be passed on while others will not make it. And then we have the process of natural selection, which favors the best suited at the time. So the organisms that are best suited to survive in their environment are the ones that are going to make it, i.e. survival of the fittest. And in inheritance, variations are inherited. The best suited variants leave more offspring. And since they're going to actually have their genes passed down from their generation to the next, their offspring more than likely are going to have a better chance to survive and adapt to their changing environment. Now it is time for our check for understanding. You may use your notes and analogy I've gained from watching this video to answer the following questions. I'm Jordan Spivey, as well as my dad, Travis Spivey. And if you haven't already, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also, check us out at our curriculum and instruction website at www.fathersoninnovations.com where we have laid out pacing guides and weekly guided topics and activities for biology, physical science, environmental science, AP Biology, and Anatomy and Chemistry are coming soon. Also, check out our online courses at www.fathersoninnovations.com forward slash courses. And we have online courses that guide you through biology and physical science. And lastly, go ahead and download our app that's available in the Apple Store and in the Google Play Store, and it's called FSI Courses. Ladies and gentlemen, like we always say, we love you and make sure you have a wonderful, awesome, positive day. Peace. Peace.